Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we're welcoming Shane Gibson. Welcome, Shane. And uh, we, as, as part of an intro, we usually explain why we have you uh, or people as a guest on here. And the reason why I've, we've invited uh, Shane on to today's episode is that he works in Wellington, just down the road from us. And um, a few years ago, a mutual friend uh, that I was working with introduced me to Shane. And Shane and I went up went for a coffee in, in Wellington, and it was a really interesting chat. And ever since then, um, we've been uh, touching base here and there. And uh, we thought that Shane has got enough uh, battle scars in the space that we're talking about in order to come share his story and, and, and come share his experience with us as well. Shane's also uh quite handy in the data space and that's also a very interesting avenue of oversight that we've explored a little bit in the past with the likes of scott ambler but we it would be good to actually hear your thoughts about things here uh, on oversight as well so shane with that i'm not gonna lay out everything because i don't know everything about your background and your experience. Why don't you share us a little bit or as much as you want about your river of life? Yeah, I'd love to. And hey, thanks for having me on the show. So uh, as you said, data analytics, that's what I've done for, for most of my life. Uh, so probably ooh, looking over 30 years now. Um, I started out uh, working in government when I came, came out of school. Uh, and, and accounts. And uh, I was lucky enough as part of that to kind of fall into a role where we uh, replaced our financial system. And that got me into the world of IT. And um, I very quickly <coughs> learned after that, that the whole area of ERP and financial systems bored me to tears. Um, but, I, but I lucked onto this uh, thing where our CFO wanted some reports. She wanted to understand, you know, how much we'd spent, who we spent it with, uh, those kind of things. And so back then, you know, it was the early days of uh, data. Uh, we had tools like Forest and Trees. So I was playing around with that. And from there, I, I went on and, and worked for a couple of uh, big US vendors for 10 years and what was called over in New Zealand pre-sales, but uh, now it's called sales engineering or customer engineering. So I, I was between the, the salespeople that wanted to close the deal and the customer that wanted the problem solved. And then from there, went out and started my own consulting company. Uh, so, you know, typical data and analytics consulting company, a uh, bunch of people that worked with us would go and, and uh, help a customer out. Um, ideally, for a couple of years was always our goal because that was the, the business model. Um, and as part of that, a couple of customers were really kind enough to let me experiment with their teams around this thing called Agile. Uh, sometimes we had to call it iterative because they'd done Agile before. Um, but really, it was this idea of adopting an agile way of working, but within the data and analytics domain. And that always had a few interesting challenges. So when I compared it to software engineering, you know, a lot of the patterns we could adopt, but we had to adopt them slightly differently, or they sometimes wouldn't work given a particular context. So I've been lucky enough to coach those teams for the last eight or nine years now. Uh, every time I, I work with a new team, I learn something new. Um, and then three years ago, uh, I co-founded a, a software as a service startup called Agile Data. So I've been spending my time between building out that that uh, that company and that product um, and still side hustling with uh, customers to help them when they need help because we're bootstrapping the startup. So uh, we've mm -hmm. got, to, got to pay the bills somehow until, you know, after seven years, we're an overnight success and highly profitable. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, anything to do with data analytics and agile and combining those two, that's kind of my passion still. Thank you for that. And uh, on combining those two, you must have had some really interesting adventures uh, and how all of the, the data and the agile or new ways of working um, adventures. And then obviously the strong connection into uh, oversight and, and governance uh, into that space. What, what's, what are some of the adventures that you can share, share with us from that link between the three, the three things? Yeah, I think um, 
the, one of the challenges with data and analytics and, and agile is uh, well, there's a couple of them that, that I've distilled over time. So one of the first ones is we typically adopt this new ways of working when we're undergoing a massive change. So we might be greenfielding as a data or analytics platform, so building from scratch. And so that gives us this pattern, which I love to call flying the aeroplane, uh, building the aeroplane while flying it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't want a big iteration zero where it's six to 12 months of navel gazing and building the wrong thing. We want to rip into it, but there's a whole lot of foundational work the team has to do in terms of their practices, their processes, and their technology stack. Um, and that's always one of the challenges. I think in the software engineering world, it's a little bit easier to build out your technology platform relatively quickly, whereas in the data world, we haven't quite caught up. I think the second thing is, for some reason, uh, the data work or the analytics work often gets bound to a big, ugly program of work. And so what we get with that is we get those legacy oversight uh, ways of working. We get those big committees. We get steering committees. We get um, communities of data governance. We get a whole lot of talky-talky and no dewey-dewey. Um, and so that's one of the other challenges I see a lot is how do we break those patterns? How do we make sure that those oversight functions are, you know, fit for purpose? They're doing just enough at the right time. How do we get those groups to focus on prioritization in the future uh, and solving those problems and bottlenecks, not micromanaging the work that mm. the teams are doing? So usual oversight problem with anybody that's moving from, um, you know, program or, uh, non-iterative ways of working to to the agile way. Mm -hmm. um, so, what 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 have you found other than those uh, things you talk about micromanage? That's <laughs> quite a strong theme. Um, we we've picked up with a, a lot of people we've interviewed. Um, <coughs> pardon me. What are some of the things that um, you you try to do in order to? Uh, try and um, not fall into a micromanagement trap from an oversight function? Uh, so I think it's really focusing on uh, when a group of people are going to do something, what it, why are they doing it? Uh, what, mm. what does it look like? What does good look like? Yeah, you know, almost like a definition of ready and a definition of done for those groups. So one of the first things I tend to do is uh, move away from a steering committee structure to a prioritization forum. So what we find is ideally prioritization is done by one person, right? We, we all know one person doing a job, as long as they're not overloaded, uh, is the most effective way of getting that work done. But often in a large organization, especially in the data and analytics space, we have so much latent demand. We have so many stakeholders or business units or supply chains or customer journeys that uh, each one of those wants some work done and we have to prioritize those. And one person uh, typically won't. So I would typically not see the chief executive prioritizing that work, who actually mm -hmm. is the only person that sits at the level where they can make that call. Um, sometimes, you know, it might get uh, delegated down to a chief data officer, but not all, not often. So one of the first things we look to do is set up a, a prioritization committee where uh, those people have a way of prioritizing the next piece of work to be done. When we do that, it, the natural pattern everybody wants is a scoring mechanism. You know, they come up with a spreadsheet and they go, well, why don't we give it complexity, uh, value to the business, uh, time to deliver, cost, risk, right? And we end up with all these numbers. And, you know, we do a spreadsheet and we prioritize and we say, this is the next most valuable piece of work. And then what typically happens is somebody goes, yeah, not really. And they change the numbers. Mm. So, you know, I look at that and I go, okay, well, that, that's a waste of effort, right? So typically the way I talk about it is the, the role of a, of a prioritization group is to horse trade. It's yes. to actually agree what's next. <laughs> yes. And then set a plan of what might not be next, yeah, at the order it might be done. And then as mm. soon as the team's ready to do another piece of work, we horse trade again. And what I tend to see, especially when you have senior people in the room, they are very good at horse trading. You know, they will have conversations like, okay, I'd love to get my bit done now, but I can see from an organization strategy or, or whatever point of view, this one is the next most valuable. Um, but you've only got these many iterations, right? And then I'm going to expect my one to, to be done next. So don't 
don't go and take the team for six months or a year, right? Because I'm not going to let that happen. But you can have the next couple of iterations. Um, and those conversations are really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, the tricks with that I found, one of the patterns or anti-patterns is when these proxies in the room. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when the people in the room aren't actually enabled to make the decisions and the proxies are either running off to ask the boss what can be done uh, or they're making calls that then get overturned when the person in power, the person with the, the mana to make the decisions uh, finds out. So, yeah. The remote override. Yeah. The, yeah. The remote override. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, the people in the room have to be enabled to make those decisions, right? Because mm. we're committing for the work the team are going to do. And change is okay, but change comes as a cost. So uh, I, this prioritization form, uh, forum, um, what has been the typical ways that you found work to establish such a forum? Um, so typically there is somebody who's kicked off the team's journey into this new Agile's way of working. Um, and that person might be called a product owner, it might be called a team lead, it might be called a manager, but they, they're effectively a leader, right? They show leadership behavior. They're normally the person that goes and uh, knows who in the organization should be on the committee, on the, on the prioritization group. Um, I've got to stop using that word committee, on the prioritization group. Um, they know the people who have the ability to make decisions and the people who don't. And they go and, and get that work done. They go and invite them. Now, what often happens is there's a bit of an adoption curve in everything we do, right? So when we start off with uh, a, a new data and analytics team and, and a new way of working, not a lot of people want to work with the team because they've heard all this before, right? They've had programs and projects and they've asked for stuff and it's never been delivered or it's not what they wanted. So we talk about, you know, nobody really wants to work with them, but after they start seeing success for a while, they all jump on, you know, and we get this massive wave of latent demand. Um, same with the prioritization group normally. Yeah, everybody's busy in meetings. Everybody's busy trying to get the work done. Everybody's got fires to fight. So again, the, the first stakeholders in that group are normally the early adopters and then once it shows success everybody else wants to to bail in and again there has to be a role in the team at a relatively senior level or, or a person with trust to manage that that change of people coming into the room to to agree the prioritization of what's next yeah what would you say are the best ways of working for these committees or these, uh, okay, it's not, sorry for the word committee, these forums or these groups? Uh, so I think th there's a couple of things that are really important that I've seen over time. Um, so often people can't articulate what data and analytics is. Mm. It, it's difficult, right? So so because it's big and we use lots of three and four letter words and lots of technology <laughs> and you know, we go, oh, do you want SCD2 or not? It's like, yeah, really? Um, so that group find it really hard to prioritize what work should be done next because they don't understand the work. Mm. So we need a way of articulating to them. And so uh, I, I have a framework or a pattern that I use called information products that I've worked with a bunch of different customers over the last eight years to refine. And so it, it's a way of describing uh, what that work is. So we describe uh, what the outcome of that work's likely to be. You know, what's the action that's going to be taken if this work was delivered? Um, it describes the business questions that are going to be answered. Mm. So, you know, if you say to somebody, how many customers have we got, we're going to answer that question. You know, they, they can understand that. It describes the personas that are actually going to get the value out of this. Who's our target? Is it a senior manager? Is it an external party? Is it an analyst? Who, who's going to get the value out of this work? Uh, it describes the core business processes. So the who does what from Lawrence Core. So what core business process are we going to deal with with this information product? Uh, it describes the way we're going to deliver it. What's the output look like? Is it a dashboard? Is it a report? Is it an API? Is it a data service? Is it, is it what is it? What, what are they getting for their money? And so effectively, this, this information goes into a, a canvas, into an A3. And that, uh, when filled out well, means that a senior leader can actually read it and go, okay, I understand what you're talking about now to a, to a level that I need to. And then they have something to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And so then what we do is we get them to prioritize those information products. Yeah, just rack them. Um, so that comes on to the second part. Once they know what, what the choices they have are, how do they make that? Um, and what I found is there's actually quite a few, there's quite a number of really good agile games uh, for prioritization. Mm. So, you know, one of my favorite is, is 500. 
they get given 500 virtual dollars. Uh, all the information products get put on the table and they vote with their virtual money. Yeah, the one with the most money wins. That's the one that has the most value. Yeah. So I, I find those those types of ones, depending on the culture of the organization and the culture of the people in the room, um, those different ways of prioritizing, uh, you need to fit it to the organization and the culture uh, of those mm -hmm. people to, to get a good fit. Yeah, um, But there's always one that works for them. Yeah, I, I've uh, heard about a story uh, where there was also this prioritization by committee and it always turned into a big bun fight and uh, a, a, whole, a whole lot of to and fro. So really getting decisions out and the uh, senior agile consultant at that stage, this was probably about 12 or 15 years ago, they, he was asked to come and sort this out. And as people walked into the room, he, he, he handed them each a $100 uh, money, Monopoly money bill. And um, uh, he, he set the new rules and said, you can only spend $100 and you, you decide on what you want to spend it on, but that's all you can spend. And he's, he said he noticed some really interesting behaviors is that people started bartering. And this is this horse trading you talked about. And then they formed a little cartel in order to go and actually figure out what did they want to spend their money on and supporting one another. So, and the beauty of that is it takes the 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 uh, it takes the drama away from the team that needs to do the work. All they want is just get something and do the work, and get something else and do the work. They are not pulled into the drama and uh, the uh, pomp and the fair and what all of that is just they can get on with the work that's quite a powerful tool i, I like that yeah and, and often we'll see a hippo behavior right the highest person in the room um yeah so that's okay I, I have no problem if there's one person in the room making the prioritization decisions great they're made right i, I don't care who makes them i just care mm. that they're made um so yeah there needs to be almost a definition of ready for that that session right they have mm. people have to be well well informed and ready to be able to prioritize so if there's pre-work they need uh, information they need before it they need to have it and they need to have done their homework before they walk in um you want to create uh, a time box you want to create an iteration yeah an hour or two that at the end of that you know there will be something that's next uh, you want that to be committed to. So change is okay, but change just before you give it to the team. You know, that's the highest cost change. Um, mm -hmm. So ideally, you know, get a bit of a roadmap about what you think might be next and two and horizon two and three, and then worry about not changing those. Um, and then the other thing I always say is if there are two priorities that come out at the top, uh, we'll flip a coin. Because what you're saying is actually both are important and it doesn't really matter. So then the team will effectively pick the one they like the most. Um, <laughs> because you're telling them that, you know, there's two priority ones, which there can't be. So, you know, it doesn't matter. We'll just go pick yeah. one. Um, wow. And that's okay, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, the work will always get done. Uh, it's just when. Yeah. I, uh, I I was bringing back to you talking about the scoring mechanism and what are you finding um, how value is usually determined if they if they score the value how is that usually determined uh, norm normally it's anecdotal so you know we, we find it hard to quantify the value of data and analytics uh, in fact we find it hard as humans to quantify the value of anything really um, yeah, you know, I talk about three levels of done now. I talk about the definition of done, which I now treat as uh, the the internal metrics for criteria for the team that they've done their job properly, a, a set of professional standards. So, you know, definition of done will be the team saying, uh, you know, I've tested my code, I've validated the data, I've reconciled it, you know, I've checked it into a repository, I've had it peer reviewed, I've written the documentation. And, and the reason I describe that is, you know, product owners and people who aren't doing the work just expect those things to be done. Mm. Right? They expect you to do your job and they expect you to be a professional. Mm. So, you know, why should a stakeholder, a product owner, if we're using Scrum terminology, why should they say, and you're going to write tests for your code? Because everybody expects to test their code. Mm. Well, they should do. <laughs> and then I talk about definition of done done, right? Which actually is, is the acceptance criteria if we're using Scrum again. Um, so that's what the product owner or the person, the stakeholder is saying that their, their tests are, right? How they're going to validate that the work 
that's been done was was to their standard or met their expectations. And then the third one is the one that I've never actually been able to experiment with a customer yet uh, properly is the definition of done, done, done. And so what that is, if we think about those information products, if the stakeholder who wants the work done could actually define the value they're going to get out of it, not just the action they're going to take, but the actual value in terms of, you know, revenue increase or cost savings or risk reduction. It's normally one of those three. Or making the right decision based on the data that they see in front of them. That's an action, right? But what what's the value Uh, of that decision? Am I increasing my revenue? Am I decreasing my my costs? Or am I reducing my risk? Those are normally the only three outcomes we ever get. So, you know, if I could say that uh, this analytical scoring model that determines the next customer to churn, right, is what I want. And the action I'm going to take is I'm going to do a save offer to them. And based on the data we have, we think the value of that save offer will be, uh, you know, a, a retention of revenue of $100,000, you know, in, in three months. That definition, if we could define that up front, then that's the definition of value, right? Yeah. And then if we could prove it after the fact, after we've delivered that information product, if we could prove that that $100,000 was delivered, then we get a better feedback loop. Because what happens is, especially in data and analytics, uh, we see it a lot in software as well, you know, where we build useless features that nobody wanted. But in data and analytics, we're often getting data and answering questions that actually don't, and, and the stakeholder who's, who's asked for it, doesn't deliver the value they promised for that effort. And data and analytics teams are expensive. Mm. So, you know, for me, if we could put a value, uh, quantify a value on it, it should help us with our prioritization. But we shouldn't treat it as theater, right? We shouldn't just pull numbers out of our backside and write it down, pretend yeah, it's I mean, actually a value <laughs> number, yeah. and then try and prioritize on it. Because just, just you're making stuff up, so just pick one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Game it, yes. Um. Horia, uh, one or two, you, you, you've been doing a lot of work in, in value, uh, understanding value, uh, et cetera. Um, what have you got to share uh, in the, the stuff that Shane has just shared with us? Any thoughts? You're on mute. You're on mute. I like the idea of um, $500 worth of um virtual pot right it's like playing monopoly um if you will that gives you an intention of out of these initiatives which ones are closer to your heart and you do so in a manner that simplifies a lot of intuitions if you will now um one technique that i found useful (laughs) with some customers is to actually work with them to identify a handful of key dimensions of value. Um, What are the the main contributions of value? And then score on those uh, dimensions. So it's it's similar in some respects with the idea that you're describing, but um, it uses a um, per topic uh, budget, if you will. And then based on that, you can actually then rank um, those dimensions and end up with a with a value score. Uh, what have you seen in this um, way of alternative value scoring? Uh, so we've experimented a bit with the Kano model. Um, so that's you know the idea of uh, what is a, what is something that people just expect. You know, what is something that's going to absolutely delight them? And I can't remember what the other two quadrants are. Um, so again, it was a way of putting uh, the work to be done in different quadrants and then picking <coughs> you know, the one that was near the top. Um, it doesn't give us a priority though, right? We we have to agree up front that, you know, if we want, are we going to focus on things that delight versus things that are expected? We have to make that call first because we want to know at the end of that process end of that, you know, prioritization iteration, what is the next piece of work to be done? Okay. Uh, another one I use a lot is five lanes. So I'll, I'll um, you know, being a good agile coach, I take out my my bag of uh, sticky notes and duct tape. Uh, yeah, so you put five lanes on a, five rows on a big table and you basically say to them, we're on a wall, and you say to them, uh, you know, there's row one's the top row, that's the highest priority. Uh, the information product that's at the left in slot number one is the first one that we do. And then we run right. And when you run out of room, 
there's a constraint there that goes down to row two. Keep going. Row four and five, probably never going to get done because you're going to reprioritize new work uh, in the future before we ever get there. Row three, depending on how much you got and how fast, yeah, you know, how complex it is, probably not going to get there. Um, row one and two probably will, right? Over six or 12 months. Um, some customers I've worked with, they wanted to put some a little bit more context around it. So they'll say row one's regulatory. You know, so I give yeah. you know, an example. If you're working for a bank and the Reserve Bank demands something, it goes in row one. Doesn't matter what's in row two, right? Row one wins. Uh, so row two becomes strategic. Row three is program or tactical. Row four or five is wish list, right? And and that's okay. I don't mind. So it's just yep. If it gives you context of what goes where. Um, but remember, we are going to prioritize from the top left. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. There was another one which was uh, dot games. So you basically get to dot a whole lot of them. Mm. And then the ones that aren't dotted get removed and we redot. And so we're constantly um, redotting until we get down to top three. Right. So again, it's a way of removing and revoting time and time again. And I'm sure there was another one like that with poker. <coughs> uh, but yeah, something like Tasty Cupcakes always has some good games yeah. that you can use from a prioritization point of view. As I said, the key thing is uh, do it so it fits the culture of the organization and the culture of the stakeholders and get them to experiment. Right. So well, here's some choices. Right. This one works this way. This one works this way. Which one's going to fit for you? And when it stops working, get them to reiterate, do a retro, right? Say, hey, that that process isn't working for us anymore. What can we change to get better prioritization? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that we find is very much like you were saying about flip a coin. If you have two things of equal importance, um, I prefer to talk about sequencing rather than prioritization. Because in sequencing, I actually have to pick this is first, this is second, this is third. And one technique that we found handy there is we have the story of the beer and the whiskey barrel um, challenge. So let's say that they're dripping and I'm losing $10 worth of um, <clears throat> beer and $50 worth of whiskey. And usually when you ask people, so which one do you want to tackle? They'll say, oh, I'm losing more whiskey. So let's, let's fix the whiskey one. And then if you say, hold on, but if I'm getting closer to the fix and I'm noticing that the beer barrel is a simple fix, only takes a minute to fix, but the uh, whiskey one uh, takes about 10 minutes to fix, how comfortable are you that we still fix the, the whiskey one? And then they think, they kind of scratch their heads a little and they go, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Because the thing is in the 10 minutes that uh, you're fixing the whiskey barrel, you're losing a hundred bucks worth of beer. Whereas in the one minute that you'd fix the, the beer one, you'd only lose 50 bucks worth of whiskey. So understanding how to balance the amount of time to achieve a value, the speed to value, and uh, divided by the duration, get an acceleration to value, really makes a difference in terms of how you should sequence things. Yeah, I, I struggle with that one because as humans, we suck at estimation. Right. And we don't want to do the work before we estimate how much it's going to cost or how long it's going to take. So we do really like guesstimation. And that is one area that gets gamified all the time. People yeah. change the estimate because they want it to make it look smaller. Now, ideally, like estimation and, and scrum, we really want to get to a stage where we're not doing it. We want to get to a stage where every information product is the same size. Mm -hmm. And then we take the idea of time out of it because we know that that unit of work right, as a unit of work, and they're all equal from a unit of work point of view. But that's hard. You know, if we talk about lifetime value, we can decompose it down to, you know, what's the revenue? What's the revenue by product? What's the tune of the customer? We can break those models down, but that is difficult. Um, so I tend to I, I tend to use T-shirt sizing at the information products at a prioritization level. I, I say, you know, small, medium, large, extra large, oh shit. Um, that's kind of the, <laughs> um, and, you know, we'd love them to go in as all smalls, um, but they don't. And then that's the only hint I tend to give um, the stakeholder around sizing. Uh, the second one is uh, you still see a lot of Moscow behavior, you know, must should, could, would. Uh, and yeah, my view is straight away. It has no value because the musts are never musts. Yeah. Mm. We must do this. Yeah. But what if we don't? And, and the number of times I've seen musts, they don't get done. So they're not musts, right? 
they're they're shoulds or coulds or woulds, but they're unless not it's regu- regulatory, yes. <laughs> Even then, sometimes there's there's delay tactics, right? I, I, yeah. I must do it, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So we've described over the last few minutes, we've described a lot of techniques and and so on. But I want to step a little bit back and ask you you. Um, what benefits do you see that an oversight practitioner uh, will gain when we practice these types of techniques in value scoring? Uh, so it, it gives us that time horizon. So, so there's 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 a couple of areas where oversight brings immense value. Mm. Um, so one is uh, planning the future lightly. Mm. Right. Uh, so what does work potentially look like? So, you know, ideally, again, if we're using Scrum, the team really would, it would be great if the team could start on day one from a standing start, get the work done in two or three weeks iteration and be done. But that's hard, right? So giving them a heads up of what possibly might be next, allowing them to lightly work ahead is a common pattern. And so without that roadmap, without that understanding of uh, an oversight of what the future might look like, it's impossible for them to work ahead lightly. So there's value in that. And then the second value is when we scale. So again, I, I say the most effective team, you know, as a team of one, uh, finding those unicorns that can do all the work on their own is incredibly hard in the data analytics space. So we tend to, you know, we have a team of four to nine. Um, and they work really well together over time. Uh, you add three more squads, pods, teams to that, you know, you get five teams of nine, we start having massive problems as we scale. And so that's where oversight comes in. And uh, I tend to now have quite a an opinionated view on, on that. And, I, and I, I like the term, I'm not sure I like the term federated, but it's the best I've got. And, and a lot of it does come from, you know, Scott Ambler's early, early writing. So I was just trying to remember the reason we caught up was because I was um, exploring discipline and agile. And that's, that's why I was talking to you. That's right. I remember that now. Um, and so in the podcast that I do, one of our guests gave me this great term that I love, and they talked about exoskeleton and internal skeleton. And so the way it works in my head is when we're in an oversight role and we've got a scaling problem, right? We've got a bunch of people that are, uh, we want to kind of corral and, and work in a certain way. We've got to decide which rules are immutable, which is our exoskeleton, right? Which is the frameworks they can't go outside without a really big discussion with us. Those are the rules of the game. And so as, as a, in an oversight rule, we should set those exoskeletons very clearly. Right? We should be able to articulate exactly what fits in the side and what we deem as being outside it. And if you want to go outside it, what's the process to have a conversation with us? Mm. There be very few rules. Yeah. Um, because those are those hard things, yeah. you know, hard walls that, that people are going to hit <clears throat> and it's going to hurt them when they hit it. So just pause there. Uh, very few rules. Um, would you say that um, having it more of a principle driven than a rule driven? Uh, I don't know, carapace or exoskeleton. Is that is that a better way? Uh, principles are a good starter, but um, I, I and I do a lot of work with principles, but I find them a good starting point, but then relatively uh, valueless because there are a bunch of words. And, and they can be interpreted many different ways. Data, you know, treat data as an asset. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to actually get a, a table and I'm going to put it on my balance sheet with a value and I'm going to depreciate it and that value depreciation value is going to go back to the team to maintain it? Or is it just, oh, we're going to think of it as an asset, right? Which of those two am I dealing with, right? I can interpret a whole lot of stuff. So I tend to think now about rules, right, which are immutable. They are very clearly defined, you know. So, you know, a rule we have in New Zealand is you can't drive your car without a seatbelt. Yeah, I know where my seatbelt's on. I know what happens if I get pulled over by the police when I don't have a seatbelt, right? It is a rule that I should comply with. And funny enough, I do. Um, it also has massive value to me, right? I can see why I'm doing it. So that's the exoskeletons, right? Those are the things that are immutable. That actually is a really big conversation. It's almost a fireable offense to break those rules. And then the internal skeleton of things we build on top of their guidance so their principles practices and patterns is the way i think about them because i think each one of those is a different yeah. different way we describe them so you know a pattern 
is something that can be used in a certain context and has proven value. So if I can describe a pattern, then most people will use it because it makes their life easy. You know, as humans, I wouldn't say we're lazy, but we like to leverage things that make complex things easy. So if we can have a bunch of patterns, internal skeletons that they build on, most people will follow them, right? They will adopt them because it makes sense. And so that's how I think about governance now. Very clearly, what's the rule that you can't break? And what's the consequence of not breaking it? And how do you describe it to me so I understand when I'm going to break it? And what's a principle, a pattern, or a practice that has value? And I should adopt it, but you're not telling me I have to. You know, you're leaving me to self-organize as you should to do the, the right context, work at the right time. And the context will determine the applicability. Yeah. 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 Um, now, those you know, those patterns are hard to describe. It's hard to describe the pattern. It's even harder to describe the context of where it could work and where it doesn't. Where principles, you know, we have a whole lot of frameworks like TOGAF that give us a really nice template to fill a principle out, right? But it's an intent. So I still start off with principles because they give me an intent. They give me a flavor. Um, yeah. So I still find them useful, but they're only the beginning of the work. Yeah. Okay. Um, th this is fascinating. Um, so you talk, I like the idea about the exoskeleton and the internal skeleton. That's a really beautiful way of describing it. And um, uh, yeah, I've never heard it being described that way specifically. Aurea, looks like you want to say something. Oh. I'm fascinated by data quality. And I think there could be a lot of opportunity in this space to get a lot of benefit without necessarily a whole lot of pain uh, in improving uh, data quality. What thoughts do you have in this space? Uh, so the standing joke in the data and analytics world, uh, Probably not so much nowadays because it has moved on a little bit in the last two years, but the way we get data quality is we push something to production and we wait for a user to identify that it was wrong. <laughs> um, and what we've seen, is, and there's been a whole change of technology in the data and analytics world over the last couple of years, and we have now what's called a modern data stack. So we've had a massive uncoupling or decoupling of our technology stacks. And so we've seen a whole lot of new technologies come out in the data profiling space, the data quality space, the data observability space. Uh, and each one of those brings uh, some capabilities in one area, but only a, a part of it, right? And so... When we look at that data quality, everybody has a different version of what that term means. So, you know, does it mean that uh, the data looks the same as it's always looked? The profile of the data is what we expect. You know, so for example, uh, there's a field called phone number and it only has phone numbers and it doesn't have any text. Well, does it mean that it's got phone numbers in there and the phone numbers comply with the phone number masking standard for New Zealand, if it's a New Zealand phone number, you know, the 021, the 027, uh, or it complies with the US one, if it's a US phone number? Or does it mean that actually the phone number works? I can ring it. Person will answer that phone number is valid. Uh, they're all data quality problems. Uh, and then we get the, the mutation problem. This data is coming in. Uh, we know what, what it looks like. We've tested it. We've made sure it's fit for purpose. And then it changes. So, you know, the obvious one is, you know, somebody changes the column in the source system from a character to a numeric, right? And that causes us massive problems. But what happens if the context of the data changes? What happens if that uh, phone number, instead of being uh, the home number, it becomes your mobile number because nobody really has a home phone anymore. Uh, what happens if it's a shared family phone number? Um, I did some work in an agency. Ooh, it would have been 15, 20 years ago. And when we were profiling their phone numbers, uh, there were a whole lot of phone numbers that said, do not ring. And what it was, was uh, it was a family member who wasn't allowed to know where this person was. And so here's a text sitting in a phone number field. Um, what do we do with that? Now, why was it there? Well, because there was nowhere else in the system for the put it, and that was what came up on the screen. So it was flashing in the, the person's face not to ring it. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's a whole lot of context around it about where we store it. Uh, 
Mm. So I think uh, data quality is one of the, the least served practices in the data and analytics space still. Uh, I think it's a hard problem to solve. I think we've got better at it, but we don't treat it as part of our profession to make sure the data is right, typically, right? We just, uh, we, we move the data, we get it ready to be consumed, and then we think we've done our job. So I struggle with that as a practice in the data and analytics space. Wow. Warrior, you're on mute. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Would it be wonderful to figure out a way of paying closer attention to cleaning data? Because too often we have something that's kind of almost good enough. And for want of a little bit of care and attention, things are getting worse. Because the beauty of practicing a little bit of um, attention to data profiling is we can identify bugs, um, structural ways in which data deteriorates. And by noticing it, you can then actually fix all sorts of problems and extinguish uh, whole categories of, of defects early on. And yeah, I, I think one of the kind of practices that we still seem to adopt, especially in corporates and enterprise companies has been around for a while, is uh, based on a, a whole lot of practices and patterns that have been around for years, but no longer fit for purpose. And it, it's almost the, the library kind of concept. It's an information management behavior, not a data behavior. And that is, for some reason, we think we can have a team of people who are responsible for data quality. You know, the data quality stewards or the data quality analyst. Mm. And somehow we think they're going to clean the data. They're mm. going to fix this problem. Or we think they're going to profile it and then somebody's going to care. Yeah, but they're, they're kind of uh, a lost voice in the wilderness. It's like, oh, look at this data. It's wrong. And everybody's like, yeah. Um, so I think we have to fundamentally change our way of working on, on data quality. I, you know, I've seen some people uh, experiment with it. Um, I think there's some good practices and patterns coming out now, but I think they're early. Uh, but I think we pretty much have to throw away everything we've done in the past. And, you know, that's that's scary because what do we do about Dharma, right? You know, we've got this massive way of working that everybody tries to subscribe to. Is it fit for purpose anymore in an agile world? Or is it based on a hierarchical organization? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one, but I think we need to change what we do in the data quality space. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Shane, we're going to change a little bit of tack here. Uh, and we, we talked about the data space. Um, let's talk a little bit about it from the other side and look at uh, what you've noticed around um, agility and oversight. But before we get there, you run your own podcast. You've mentioned that before. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so I, I run two. So I've done the Agile Data podcast for quite a few years. Uh, it used to be called the Agile BI podcast before we moved away from BI to data in the world, <laughs> and I followed the trend. Um, and so that one for me, uh, it's just been a personal hobby. I kind of wanted to get mm -hmm. into podcasting. I, I know a little bit about data and analytics, and I knew some people who did it. Uh, and so I I just talked to guests that uh, right back in those days, we were just telling stories, right? They had an interesting story of what mm -hmm. they did. And I wanted to share that story. Uh, these days, what I focus that one on is patterns. When I find somebody who has uh, patterns on how you apply agile in the data space, uh, I try and get them on the show to talk about those patterns. Um, so that one's a little bit ad hoc. And then the other one is the No Nonsense Agile podcast. Um, so that was a funny story. So uh, I do that with a gentleman by the name of Murray out of Australia. And uh, we had met up once. Murray was a, during uh, COVID, the lockdown, the first one, he was great at reaching out to lots of people and just having virtual coffee. So I had a chat to him. Uh, and then on LinkedIn, he posts, um, you know, who's got the best agile podcast out there? And I, you know, which one should he listen to? And I said, oh, here's a list of them. But, I, you know, a lot of them don't, don't do it for me. Um, and so he, I said, but I really would love to experiment with one. So if you're keen on doing it, let's do it. So he did. Uh, what we found is is the first 10 or 20 episodes, I think, is Murray and I arguing with each other. 
we we agree a lot but we disagree uh on semantics so you know we have a constant argument about skills versus roles which i'm still winning thank you murray um he doesn't agree uh and oh now we gotta have him on <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and um and then murray's a great connector so what he started doing was finding people in the agile world who've been doing it for a while and had something valuable to say and now we bring them on as a guest um, so yeah, it's been kind of exciting. We do one a week effectively, uh, one guest a week, and uh, yeah, just uh, have a, a lovely chat to them. Well, for me, it's a lovely chat. Uh, Murray asks lots more intelligent questions. I I learn so much out of them. It's this, and I meet some of my heroes. Right, I've met Scott Ambler. Uh, you know, I've met some other people that have always been on my list of people I'd love to meet, um, and I've met them virtually now. So that's pretty cool. That's excellent. So. Looking back at the last year from those two podcasts, what were the top three ideas you've encountered? Uh, so if I look at the no-nonsense one, uh, because we we talked to basically a bunch of leaders, which is kind of interesting. So leaders in the agile space, but also leaders in the product space. Uh, so those things that you wouldn't typically call agile because it's not scrum, it's not flow, it's not safe, right? It's not using those, those terms but they are founded in agility. Mm. Um, I think one of the takeaways I have is companies that are formed in the 70s and the 80s are hierarchical. Mm. That, that's their, that's their DNA. And actually, they can try and be agile, but they probably never will be. Now, it doesn't mean that agility doesn't have value to them, right? Changing the way they work and bringing in some of the agile practices uh, have value to them, but they're never going to be agile organizations uh, unless something fundamentally changes. And anybody, you know, 2000s onwards, typically is founded in agility, right? Those organizational hierarchies don't exist. Uh, they, they operate in a different way. So that's the first thing. Uh, I think the second thing is there's a lot of companies out there that were founded after the 2000s that don't do agile, don't aren't agile in the ways that most of us talk about. They don't use Scrum, they don't use Kanban, they don't use Lean, right? They don't use the terms we use, uh, but they behave in the same way, right? They adopt those mm. patterns, and I found that really interesting. Uh, another thing is a large number of the agile leaders in the world started this in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. You know, XP, all the these kind of like new agile things that are new, I thought were agile and where it came from. You listen to them and they've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, so I thought that was quite good. Uh, we have yet to find somebody that would defend safe. <laughs> Uh, but we've had lots of feedback that we should stop bagging it. Um, okay. <laughs> so <Messing> with the marketing. <laughs> no, no, actually, it's a fair call out. What people have said is if you have an agile mindset, then stop bagging something and actually, you know, see where it has value. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a fair call, right? So I've been a little bit better at not bagging it as often. I still don't believe it has as much value as every other practice. Um, so those are probably the key things that come off the top of my head. Thank you. That's quite interesting. Okay. So <coughs> let's talk a little bit about uh, oversight and governance and um, not necessarily where it plays out in data, but in general, what you're noticing in organizations. So What's your uh, journey uh, taught you or in, an experience taught you about oversight? Uh, so I think one of the definitions of ready for a team that wants to adopt this new way of working should be what I've now termed the heat shield. There needs to be a person in the organization that's sponsoring that change, right? Mm. That, that's willing to, uh, that's looking for the, a change in the organization to happen and they're willing to entertain this idea of agile ways of working is, is helping that change and they need to have the power or the mana in the organization to be able to create this this heat shield this umbrella for the team for a period of time to make them safe so you know normally i'd say three to six months right because this we're changing everything on them right we're changing their team structure we're changing the things they do the way they work the terms they use we're changing everything about how they operate and they need time to kind of break and reform. And so that heat shield is probably the number one government thing we need. 
uh, I'm still strongly opinionated on uh, anything that involves a committee has no value. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, I've just talked for a bit of the podcast about how you can have a group of people prioritize, right? So, yeah, I probably need to look at the other areas of oversight or governance and say, okay, apart from prioritization, what else has value, right? What else mm -hmm. needs to be a team sport outside of the group uh, that's doing the work? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still, I, I don't, I still see uh, non-agile behaviors whenever we use the word governance. It just seems to come with it, right? It's kind of command and control yeah. seems to be founded in that term for some reason. And that's precisely why we're doing this podcast is to look at that chasm, is to look at what's the tensions at play there that prevents the one from moving over or blending or, you know, finding a win-win on both sides of that equation. Um, so a lot of our first episodes have been just sharing the research we've done uh, in the initial two years of this journey that we've on, that we've been on. And um, it, it, it's quite fascinating to, to see how those tensions play out in organizations. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, we can take you through this at at another stage if if you want to. Um, you mentioned something about frameworks earlier about bashing a specific framework and um, now now one thing I'm noticing and and I I want to propose that this is potentially a failure of oversight. And here is what I've noticed is that. Frameworks are selected, but the reasons for those selections are never clear. It's either because it's a golf course deal, you know, you took the decision maker out on a golf day, or it is very good sales uh, and marketing about it, or there's this, oh, the neighbors have done it, so we should also do it. Um, but the, 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 the reasons, the why of adopting a specific framework is really clear. So for me, that's a failure of oversight. Not asking why are you choosing framework X and not Y or Z, whatever the case might be. What are you noticing in, 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 your, um, in your circles around that? Uh, look, this is where I become very opinionated. Uh, frameworks have value but the value is not the framework I, I treat it as pick and mix right there are patterns in every framework and every agile approach that have value given a certain context we should experiment with all of them uh somebody once said to me that the really good value of safe is there's an a3 diagram that gives them a, a menu of all the other things they can look at right mm. well there's some value um we had uh Jorgen Apollo on the podcast and he's got unfix um, and that's the one that probably resonates the most with me because it almost looks like Spotify and what they published uh, in terms of the idea of, you know, rows of uh, lines of people that are working in a value stream or, or are working together. And then, you know, an intersection of uh, columns, so a bit of a matrix and then dots for uh, specialty areas. And so that resonated with me the way he described this and told the story, because that's the, the patterns that I've had the most success with with teams. Uh, I was fixated with less for a while. Um, because I liked the idea that it does it only focused on the things that you needed as you scaled. What's the minimum viable scaling? But what I found is it's really hard to understand. Well, it was for me, right? The, I couldn't quite under, find enough to self-learn or, or do those kind of things. Mm. So I did that. Um, I loved Dad when it first came out, right? That was because it was a toolkit. And, and I still really subscribe to the idea of a toolkit, of a pattern toolkit. Um, but like all things, when you do that, it's hard to find the pattern you want. It's hard to go through the, the, the toolkit, right? You've got to figure out the journey. And that's that's difficult to find the thing you need when you need it. Um, so I don't personally believe in frameworks. I think every team should build their own way of working. They should adopt patterns from all the approaches and all the mm. frameworks, uh, and they should build their own. You know, uh, yeah. One of the things I found I did as a coach early on was I would always bring in what I did at the last customer because it worked. Mm. And it, it took me a while to smack myself in the face and go no hold on hold on hold on first step is go and observe right yeah. observe what's happening 
get some ideas, right? And then, you know, once you've observed, inspect a little bit, maybe, you know, have a chat to them, see what they think is important, and then agree with the team what they want to adapt, right? What do they want to focus on and experiment with? Versus going in and going, hey, this is the way you do it, right? Yeah. Let's start off with Scrum because we all and do then, And then you get an eye roll. It's another one of those. We're in for oh. a rough ride, boys. <laughs> yeah, and, and quite rightly, because yes. you're walking in there with, you know, rolling out your framework, bringing out the PowerPoint slides first. Uh, I think some of the frameworks are based on a pyramid scheme of money. You know, there's certification. Uh, the, you know, it would be fair to say in New Zealand government, there is now a barrier that if you're not safe certified, you probably won't get a lot of work in the agile space. Is that a good thing? No. No, I don't think it is. I think that's put a paywall up where a bunch of people have to go and spend money on certifications to be able to help teams. Mm. Uh, and yeah, so very opinionated on this idea of frameworks. I think they have value. Um, but they're not the answer. You can't just plop a framework in. That's not my view of agility. So how would you say that influences the work of oversight? If 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 it's so, if, if that's the, the 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 issues you've identified, um, an oversight person looking from the outside in, how is that going to influence their work? No idea. Uh, my answer is I work with teams. Uh, yeah. And then, then it's okay. I don't have to care. Uh, but even then, that's not true. I do have to care because then funny things happen. So, you know, often uh, the data and analytics team, for some reason, uh, especially in corporates, are uh, one of the first teams to experiment. And actually, I think one of the reasons of thinking about it now is they don't have software development teams. Mm. Yeah, you know, they bring in off the shelf or SaaS products. So they don't have a core set of teams. They might have a digital team, maybe, or, or the first ones to experiment with agility. But then uh, data and analytics teams often, often start off next. And so what happens is that adoption curve, right? Everybody goes, yeah, 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 this agile thing. And then when they start seeing success, they go, oh, this agile thing. Um, and it flabbergasts me in big corporates that what happens often next is somebody there bring then brings in an external party to define their agile framework. And that person doesn't actually talk to the team that's doing it. And so it's like, so sorry, this team over here is doing it. And you see their practices and processes and patterns may not be fit for purpose for the rest of the organization. They probably need to be iterated, but that's okay. But then you bring in some expert or sometimes not even an expert to write an agile guide. Uh, mm -hmm. which everybody's going to follow. And it's like, well, how does that work? Like, you know, that's just, or pick up a framework. Um, and so for me, I struggle with that one, right? It's like, why? why? Like the rule is, you know, iterate, experiment, learn. Go create, yes. Yeah, give it a go. Yes. Pick up the practices this team doing and apply it to another team and watch it fail and then say, okay, what do you need to change, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, how do we articulate what they're doing? That's hard. Uh, do they come and observe, right? Yeah, what, what's your process that you're going to experiment with for scaling out these practices or a set of practices? Um, so yeah, I, I struggle with that one. And so I pretty much don't work in that space because yeah. I don't have an answer and I can't help. But, but again, these are key questions that any oversight capability need to ask. It's like you want to adopt Agile or you want to go on a digital transformation. These are key questions that oversight need to ask why is it um, want to do this or that yeah and, yeah and so yeah there's a bunch like i said uh roles versus skills uh project managers as a term there's a bunch of trigger words that murray my co-host knows and uh so one of them i have is transformation so we oh. think about transformation <laughs> so uh you know a caterpillar creates a chrysalis it crawls inside and covers itself and then after a period of time, it, it comes out of the chrysalis and it's a beautiful butterfly, it's transformed. And then it flies off and it dies. Is that what we want? It sounds like a project to me. It sounds like a program. It doesn't sound like a, an iterative way of working. You know, so we should be constantly changing and transitioning. You know, We shouldn't be transforming because that, has, that term has a whole lot of beginning and ending behavior in it. Uh, you know, Another joke I used to have is, uh, how do you get an agile management office in an organization really quickly? Well, you take the PMO and call them a VMO, 
you know, they're no mm. longer a pro program management office, they're a value right. management office. Well, you know, we've just put different slippers on the same people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How do we expect change to happen when we do that? So I think when you're talking about bigger organizations and when you're talking about that oversight outside of a team and the heat shield for that team, uh, I think it's a scaling problem, right? We've got a whole lot of problems that need to be solved. Um, and yeah, I don't have patents yet for how to solve them. It's a really interesting challenge. What we're trying to do, because on the one hand, we want to be safe, right? I don't, I don't want to try stuff that is scary, that may fail. Um, I don't want to be looking bad. I want to do things that are proven in other places and therefore they're safe. I want to have certainty that whatever decision I make is going to be a good decision. Um, I don't want to be seen as being irresponsible. I don't want to take risks that are undue. Yeah. So as a result of those desires, Therefore, I will look around and see what can make things safe for me, what can be sure and certain, um, what can be reassuring in terms of course of action. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, there is no certainty. Uh, yeah. If I go, how do I get a certainty of estimating work to be done or do the work? Oh, no, but hold on, that won't work because once I've done the work and I knew how long it took, next time I do it, I do it in a different way or the context of the organization has changed. So there is no certainty. Yeah. Uh, there is no safety. There needs to be, there needs to be, um, I don't know how, how to kind of explain this one. There needs to be safety in the way that it is okay to fail, but people don't get hurt. Mm. Um yeah, we need to make sure that you know everybody is okay, and we lose a lot of that, especially in Scrum. You know, we're sprinting all the time. There's no, there's no safety of the team uh, often. You know, they get into this rat race, this hamster wheel of constant delivery. Yeah, you know, they lose the fun and the joy of the work they're doing. Often, it's a it's a burn. So we need to bring some some patterns and to give them a break and let them do that. Um, but you know, every time somebody says, oh, I want certainty, it's like, well, you have no certainty in how you're doing it now. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, another another trigger word, risk spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, where we write the risks down and color code them in to make the governance group go away. Yeah. We, but we don't use them often. We don't use it to manage the risk. Uh, we don't, you know, we talk about the mitigation, but then we don't actually mitigate it. Um, so I think there's a lot of theater in the way we work in, in large organizations uh, that cause us problems. But then small organizations, are, uh, you know, they have a whole lot of different problems. You know, it's not just large organizations versus, you know, uh, the small organizations have a whole lot of different risks and uncertainty and, you know, um, their ability to fail is different uh, for a whole raft of reasons. One of the other things that came out on the podcast, the kind of theme that stuck in my head is there is a difference between a manager and a leader. Mm. Can't articulate exactly what it is, can't quantify it, but it is different. There, there is very much leadership behavior and managers. And the other one that was really interesting for me is a good leader can become a manager for a short period of time when it's necessary, but they will then go back to being a leader. They will let go. Uh, that's hard. Yeah, because once you got your hands on there, right? Once you got that, you know, you're managing the work to be done. Um, yeah, letting go again because it's it's hard. So that's what good leaders do. And I think again, good leaders and organizations uh help with the the adoption of agility. Um, but I, I don't agree with the certainty in any of the practices, agile or not. Mm. I wasn't suggesting that there is. I was, as you might imagine, um, expressing a point of view, right? So I was attempting to put myself in the shoes of decision makers um, that operate in, a, in an organizational context in which risk-taking is not rewarded. Mistake-making is actually severely punished, right? If I operate in the social sector, uh, be it uh, New Zealand or Australia or um, other um, countries that have um, 
shall we say, uh, a democracy as a as a foundation, um, you don't look good by making mistakes, right? You don't want to end up on some form of. Um, in the past, uh, there was talk of I don't want to appear on the front page of the newspaper, right? These days, uh, it would be some form of social media um, scandal or or shaming. So yeah, and yeah, and 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 I agree. If you're in the public service in New Zealand, because that's where I that's where I work, uh, you're in a horrible situation right now, because you need to change the way you work. Right, the whole world's changed, and you need to the, those practices need to change. But you're in an organization that perceives it can't afford the risk of that change, and society won't let them fail. Uh, so we only ever tend to report on the failures, not the successes. And so that that's a hard job to do. Um, and also, you know, your shareholder changes every three, six, nine years. And your, you know, the intent of what you do as an organization supposedly doesn't change, but the, the theme does, right? The core values get changed. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things I struggle with. So uh, one, of, one of the teams I worked with, uh, uh, and I actually just had um, the person I worked with there who was kind of the, the the change agent on the Agile Data podcast. And she she gave me a term that I love, and it was called permaculture. Um, she, she's weirdly interested in mushrooms and fungi and trees and a whole lot of ecosystem mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but this idea of permaculture, and, and so I've been thinking about that for a long time. And, and one of the things I struggle with is um, when the chief executive of an organization changes off and the previous chief executive was quite agile focused, right? They'd worked in organizations that, that adopted agility and they'd brought that change into the organization. And then they leave. Often the new person comes in and throws it away. Yeah. Just wipes it out. So, oh, ah, yeah, yeah, agile stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't work for me last time. Um, and that's brutal, right? How how can we say we're successful in our domain if a senior person can come in and the organization gives up? It just lets that happen. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think uh, you know that that's hard. Yeah, it's very interesting how. As you say, the organization lets it happen. So we could argue that it's not the the people uh, reporting to the new chief executive could do anything about it. It's actually the person that the chief executive reports to. It's usually not a person, but some form of um, appointment committee or a board of oversight in some ways um, in the social sector, there will be some form of ministerial um, oversight possibility. Yeah. And, so, and we've also, yeah, we've seen that pattern, right? The new chief executive comes in and, you know, first thing they do is organizational change and the tier twos that report to them get wiped out, mm -hmm. you know, and then new tier twos come in and they, you know, they restructure tier three and tier four, right? And uh, poor old people at the front line doing their job. It's like, oh, you know, why are they doing this? I just want to get on and serve the person that that needs my help. Yeah, I need to achieve that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the things that has come out a lot is this idea of setting a, a shared goal. Right? Uh, as a leader, understanding that setting the goal and the vision and, and telling people where you want to go and then letting them get on with going there mm. is, is one of the things uh, that a good leader does. Uh, but that's hard, right? Hard to articulate your goal. And if your goal is to make money, uh, how many people are aligned with that? Like some are, but I think we're going to see organizations that have a goal that's greater than, you know, a greater good goal, a goal that's greater than just making profit. And that uh, goes back to how we express value, um, how we score that value. Is it just on a monetary uh, uh, basis or are we looking at, uh, you know, the triple bottom line? Are we looking at what's the impact on people? What's the impact on customers? What's the impact on nature or environment? And, and, and that's why I think it's important that when we do that value scoring, that we understand those dimensions, the dimensions that Aurea discussed. Yeah. And also we, we have to be 
okay that some people don't have the same goals or, or morals or ethics or, or view on the world as us. Um, so, you know, when I start off with a new team, uh, early on, I will have a conversation with each of the team members about this is going to be a massive change. And, you know, you've effectively been voted onto an island and nine times out of 10, you didn't get a choice about whether you got put on that island or not. Prisoner. And, <clears throat> yeah, and it's okay to vote yourself off the island. It's okay to say you don't actually want to work this way. It's not for you. Mm. Give it a go, right? You should at least give it a go and experiment with it because often a lot of people that I think would vote themselves off uh, become the biggest proponents of it. They love mm. it, right? It takes some time. But it should be okay for somebody to say, this isn't right for me. And then the organization should be very clear about what that means. You know, does that mean you can go work in another team that doesn't work this way? Or does that mean actually you're not aligned with the organization and the organization will do the right thing and help you find a role somewhere else? Um, and I think it's the same when we get uh, organizations that are, you know, are kind of driven by personal goals, you know, that, that whole idea of, of personal worth. Uh, yeah, when you make that change as an organization, you've got to be clear that, you know, some people just want to work, get the money and go home and have their lives. They don't want to work for an organization that's focused on something other than that. And that's okay, right? Might, you know, if, if they don't align, then they don't align. Um, but we need to treat people with respect when we do these changes. Otherwise, we can do a lot of harm. Um, and, you know, we should be the, you know, one of the things, I think we, we had an experiment with it in New Zealand and it didn't really go anywhere. Um, and I picked up uh, a, a coaching ethics um, from Bob Galen. Um, he he mm -hmm. gave me his one or shared it with me and I iterated on it for, for what made feel right. I think we need each, each agile coach, right, should actually say, here's the things I subscribe to. Yeah, here's mm -hmm. the things I believe in. Here's what I will do. Here's what I won't do. And mm -hmm. then we should hold ourselves accountable to it. Because, you know, we're dealing with people's lives here and it is a massive change. And if we do things wrong, we can do damage, right? We can mm -hmm. hurt people and we shouldn't, uh, not intentionally, right? We should be very clear on, on what we believe. Um, so, yeah. That's very thoughtful. Um, so in closing, what haven't we asked you that we should have? Oh, I think there's 101 uh, questions around governance that uh, you probably got better guess than me to, <laughs> to talk about. Uh, I don't know. I think um, where's the agile community going? So if we think about an adoption curve, you know, a lot of people have now said that we're in the late majority uh, for agile. And, yeah. you know, uh, I have a joke with Murray, you know, he was an author, co-author of a book called Agile 2.0, and I'm not a great fan of 2.0 and 3.0 and that kind of thing. But it was a good question, right? It was the manifesto was written many years ago, uh, had the context of the time. Uh, we've experimented a lot, we've learned a lot. Uh, I still think it's valid um, because it's a set of principles, right? It's a set of words that, that still ring true to me. But what's next? You know, what is the next iteration of this way we work? Um, because something's going to come out. We, we know, you know, history tells us when we get to that late majority, uh, something new pops up at the early adoptive mode, right? Um, so ooh, what ooh, is ooh. it? I've got a term. It's called digital transformation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've done that one as well, right? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what, what new buzzword from one of those big analyst firms that have lots of uh, young graduate people in shiny suits that need to uh, get put on site? What's the next buzzword for them? I don't know. I think we'll, yeah, we see lots of buzzwords um, and that's yeah. dangerous. Uh, I think there's lots of agile practices that have got lost. I think a lot of the lean and flow practices are more fit for purpose, but Scrum's easier to understand, or it was for me, easier to coach, easier to adopt. Um, so I think we might see moving back a bit more towards those flow flow patterns, maybe. Or maybe somebody else will, will iterate and come out with, with something else that's better than what we do now, which would be great, right? As long as it doesn't get wrapped up into a whole bunch of certification and money making as the core goal, right? Um, Oh, yep. how are you going to govern that, man? <laughs> well, the good thing, here's a question for you. Why is there no agile governance? And that's what we're exploring. Not, so, not in an organization, but outside the organizations. Yeah. Why is there, you know, why is there no 
professional i mean we have you know agile alliance and, and scrum alliance and those kind of things but they seem to be for me looking from the outside in now more training organizations than mm. professional bodies mm. um you know I, but i don't know do, I, do we I, need one i have a few um hypotheses about why don't we already have something meaningful in the agile oversight, agile governance um, kind of space. First and foremost, people that it would be aimed at have a habit of being extremely busy and having calendars chock full of, of stuff. Therefore, most of the time, they won't take the time to actually invest in some form of educational approach that's systematic. Uh, another difficulty is, oh, uh, I went on a two-day Agile um, oversight or Agile governance course, and now I'm a certified Agile uh, governancer. Yeah, that um, is unlikely to work all that flash. Very much like, uh, oh, I took the IC Agile, Agile coaching course. Uh, now I'm an Agile coach. Look at me. Six years ago, I was flipping burgers, um, which... <laughs> You might laugh, but I've literally come across people um, like that. So um, <clears throat> the difficulty is most of us want instant benefit. Yeah, I don't want to do much effort. I just want to know. I just want to be good. I want to be a master of my craft. But please don't make me think. Uh, don't make me uh, spend a lot of time and effort um, at it. Can I just you know, like in the matrix, uh, take the blue pill and boom, I know Kung Fu or, or, or something like that. Um, <laughs> therefore, it's going to be really tough. It's going to be really, really challenging because you want to get better at oversight. You want to get better at governance. It requires dialogue. It requires conflict navigation. It requires the determination to say some things that are painful that are uncomfortable, that um, sometimes people, particularly the, the higher up in the echelons of um, organizational authority you go, the more ego comes into the picture uh, more often than not. And therefore, if you dare to challenge the orthodoxy, the current way that we're doing things right now, or I'm calling the shots right now, then it's off with your head, very much like in Alice in Wonderland and the Queen of Hearts. So uh, again, other difficulties in getting um, Agile and Adaptive Oversight going, which, by the way, is the reason why we're making this as a podcast, so we can hopefully explore some of these uncomfortable topics and make it so that people don't take it personally, because they hopefully will realize that we're not interested in bagging people. And saying, you idiots, you're doing this and that. How dare you not do a good job? No, we're not at all interested in that. We're very much interested in redemption, in helping people to become amazing leaders, amazing practitioners of wise and inspired oversight, courageous practitioners of, of dialogue that actively go and look at what is actually going on and invite people into the conversation, into dialogue. But it's not just about making things safe. It's also about practicing courage. So the challenge I think we have fundamentally as a community in terms of where do we go next with agility is how do we cultivate the courage to keep each other more engaged, more in tune with one another and less despairing or, or despondent, right? Because you've also heard Agile is dead, right? Um, there, there's no more um, a validity. It's 20 years old. Who cares? Well, actually, until such time that you can show me something way better and we can do that, Agile ideas are still particularly valid. The problem then is mislabeling of things because when you see a lot of friction and action that's ineffective and you say oh it's agile because they have daily stand-ups oh it's agile because they have retrospectives well no 
it's mislabeled. <laughs> it, it's fake agile, <laughs> right? Yeah, and um, I still think, you know, a team that do daily stand-ups and nothing else is better the team than a team who don't. You know, a team that only talks to each other once a week uh, is not as good often as the team that talk to each other each day. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I, I remember when I first started this journey, I, you know, I first heard the word agile and I started exploring and reading up on it. I thought it was a bunch of hippies doing kumbaya. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, hippie. Yeah. But, you know, um, but as I used it more and learned the value of it, I was like, yeah. I think the other thing is we've got to understand that the senior leaders at organizations, uh, this is all new to them. Their literacy is low. I mean, I look at, you know, somebody was laughing at me the other day when I was texting on my phone because I was using my fingers to type the words. And, you know, young digital natives all use their thumbs. Um, and so my literacy on using that is, is low compared to theirs. Uh, if you're a senior person in an organization, you know, you got taught through your business schools and through, you know, your experience that command and control is the way an organization works. And we use lots of, cool agile words right we're almost as bad as the data industry um we use words that don't make sense um and so again who's teaching them who's making them more literate on the value of these things who's making it so that they don't need to be scared when all these weird words get used really quickly and they don't understand what everybody's talking about because that's a massive amount of uncertainty for them and why would they let somebody do something in the organization where they don't understand what it is and it can't be articulated to them in a way that they do understand. Mm. It's like, hell no, well, I don't understand what you're saying. So why would I take that risk? So I think, you know, there is a, a core role there mm. in helping uh, leaders become literate in, in what we do and why there is value in what we do. Um, so, yeah, still a lot to do, even though we are, you know, even though Agile is dead, right? It's like uh, the data warehouse is dead, I keep hearing, right? but the core principles of a data warehouse still have value. Um, so, yeah, it's not yeah. turning to liquid assets. It's now a lake, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we've gone past lake. We've now got a fabric and we've got a mesh. So uh, oh, okay. you know, we, we love to use new buzzwords, right? Uh, for, for Sometimes for the same old stuff, but sometimes for, for new. So it's still an exciting time to be. And uh, yeah, for me, still working with a team and watching them grow and uh, change the way they work and start enjoying their work again and getting success. That still gives me a buzz every day I see that happen. So that's a cool place to be. And that's the hope for the future, really. Uh, small, highly engaged teams that achieve great results for their stakeholder communities. That's the way to go. Because mm. if you have teams that actually achieve great results for their customers and their customers go, wow, this is great. Give me more. How are you going to mess with that? And why? Right. Who's going to let you when you're mm -hmm. delivering value like that? So we need more of that. Wonderful. And with that, I would like to thank Shane for a wonderful series with us. I'm Horia. And I'm Aldo. Thank you, Shane, for your time. And uh, thanks for sharing your ideas and thoughts with us. No problem at all. It's been a great chat. So thank you, team.